Hi, welcome to the InterAxis YouTube channel and InterAxis.io. Today we're going to keep talking about stable coins. In this case, we're going to talk about DAI, which was kind of the first big uh, ERC20 um, stable coin that was almost completely algorithmically based. It's almost completely programmatically based to try to uh, incentivize people to get to a dollar. But first, Remember, we keep uh, putting out content like this. We keep putting out videos. We talk about all these topics in DeFi and crypto and blockchain, and we want you to be the, the first to know about it. So go ahead and subscribe to the channel here, and that way you'll know when we have more videos. You can comment below, please. Uh, tell us what you think. Um, we'd love to hear from you. Follow us at, at Interaxis8, at Interaxis8 on Twitter. Uh, and don't forget to subscribe here to get more of this uh, content that we're putting out for you. Now we're going to keep talking about stable coins. We've talked about how important stable coins are in the idea of programmatic money. The uh, blockchain technology, what Bitcoin gave us, this ability for this, um, uh, ideally, this this peer-to-peer -peer transfer, this disintermediation of money, being able to transact internationally without necessarily going to the banking systems without necessarily uh, being beholden to government regulation and all that that's the idea that Bitcoin gave us that all these other chains especially ethereum have kind of run with and with this idea of not having to rely on the banking rails but in order to do that in order to lock up money in smart contracts and such that money has to be programmable so how do you do that because you don't want that volatility you don't want the volatility of Bitcoin and eth and other cryptocurrencies because as we've talked about in the past, if, if you have that, you can't transact business because business isn't always an immediate transaction. Sometimes it is 30, 60, 90, 120 days or even longer that you have contract terms. You denote your business in a certain currency uh, for a length of time and you can't have the value of that currency wildly fluctuating. Therefore, you have to have something that is relatively stable in order to have this international uh, transfer, in order to have this international finance, this ecosystem, this trade. So that's why we have stable coins. Now there are different uh, derivatives. Most of the stable coins have decided to peg themselves, decided that the dollar is where they're going to go. They're going to try to be a US dollar because the US dollar is the global it's the global reserve currency, as we call it. It's the currency that everyone uses in international transactions. It's what everyone looks at. So all these stable coins, whether they're, as we talk about USDT, USDC, uh, they're uh, DAI in this case, they're basically offloading the decision of monetary policy to the US Fed and saying, you guys keep track of how much a dollar is actually worth, what kind of basket of goods and services that dollar will buy. We're going to keep track of making programmatic money that we can then assign to smart contracts and everyone can keep denoting everything essentially in dollars. Okay, so now we're moving on to talk about DAI. DAI was kind of the first uh, experiment in this uh, and, and the idea of DAI is uh, kind of an incentive structure. So the, the, the maker foundation and again, I'm going to, as usual, not go way far into the technical details. So if there's some technical details that either we miss or, or we don't address or we do uh, uh, a little bit differently, it's because we're trying to get the point across. We're not trying to get all the technical details. If you want all the technical details, uh, there's white papers, there's articles, there's other videos that get way into the tech. We're talking about the basics of how DAI works, how this programmatic money, algorithmic money works. So the Maker Foundation created the Maker DAO. DAO, remember, is uh, decentralized autonomous organization. So basically they created the rules and they dropped them on the blockchain. They, they have this, con, this smart contract that says here's how the rules work. And what they were trying to do, of course, is create the algorithms, create the incentive structure. You remember we went through a whole two weeks on incentive structures. Create the incentive structure to make the users, the investors, the people who are in the cryptocurrency world undertake certain behaviors and all those behaviors would, would create this token called DAI that would be worth roughly a dollar. That's what we're getting at. Okay, now imagine how complex that is to say we're going to take all these cryptocurrencies that are trading on centralized and decentralized exchanges that have all this wild volatility 
and we're going to try to compress all that volatility and say we're going to spit out something that's worth a dollar and we're going to spread out so many of them that the whole decentralized finance infrastructure can potentially work using this particular token that is worth a dollar. We're going to take all that volatility out. That is quite a task when you think about it. And, and I think we take for granted what the Maker Foundation did because it's actually remarkable that uh, it, it, it hasn't blown up. It's remarkable that it's done so well. It's had some trials. It's gotten back to where it needs to be. They've had to change governance a bit. but. Where we are now is really impressive. So what they did is they created essentially, we'll, we'll call it the, the black box, the algorithm, whatever we want, and they had to give people this incentive to say, look, you're, you're already in the cryptocurrency world, right? We, had to use, we have to use other programmatic money for this, and other programmatic money in the first case of this was ETH. So we need, to, we need people to lock up their ETH in these vaults. At the time, they weren't called vaults. They were called CDPs. Now they, they call them vaults. You lock up your ETH. Okay, and in return for that, you get DAI. Now, why would you want to do that? Why would anyone lock up their ETH to get DAI? Well, they might do it because DAI, remember, is worth roughly a dollar. They can maybe transact in that. If I want to go uh, actually make a transaction, if I want to lend money, if I need to send you know, a hundred bucks to someone who's around the world and I don't want to use the banking system because it's going to cost me $25 to send the hundred, I might just send them die. Say, give me your wallet address, I'll send you a hundred die. We both agree that that's worth a dollar. Uh, we've done this ourselves. We have sent die to people that have done some work for us around the world. Okay, so they might want that because now you can transact in die much easier because it's denoted in a dollar. So what do I have to do? I have to lock up my ETH. So you lock up your ETH in the vault. Now, what happens is there, there needs to be some collateralization ratio. So let's say for, for these purposes that ETH is worth $300. I lock up one ETH. Now, in, in, in essence, there's a 150% collateralization ratio. So the ETH is the collateral. Here. This is the collateral I'm locking up. So for $300, for one ETH worth $300, I get 200 die out of it. Now, again, why might I do that? Why wouldn't I just sell the ETH for $300 or 300 die and send that? And the reason partially is because I think ETH is going to go up to 500. So I want to hold on to my ETH, but I want to be able to borrow and transact and die. This is just borrowing. I'm borrowing die and I'm locking up my ETH. That's all I'm doing. And they've done this algorithmically to where um, the, the incentives are there, the, the interest I'm going to pay is such that I think this is going to go up more in value than the interest I'm going to pay. So what happens, I get my 200 die, I can send it wherever I need to go. Now, if I want to unlock that ETH, I need to pay the die back plus some interest. And the interest I pay is uh, using the maker uh, token. Okay, so now the, the issue we have to uh, attack is the volatility. Well, the 150% collateralization rate helps with that volatility because it, it means that, that I put in one ETH, which is worth $300, and I only got 200 die back. So even if ETH goes down to 275, this is still good. Right, because they only issued 200 die. Now, the 150% collateralization is because, remember, at the time that this was issued, the, the swings in cryptocurrency were so wild that they had to, to put that 150% collateralization rate. The problem is, if it got below this, if it got to like $140, uh, if it got to 140% collateralization, so if, if ETH went down to $280, now, my position would get liquidated, okay? And so basically, since this was locked in a smart contract, the vault would, would essentially take it. It would, it would basically burn, you know, I, I, would, I would get to keep my die, I would get some of my ETH back, but it would, it would get burned, okay? So um, my, collateral, my collateral would be taken, and that's how they uh, protected the value of the die. 
So this interest rate was always changing to give people the incentive to put more into the vault or, or potentially uh, take out of the vault. We didn't have to worry as much about the collateral because any time it fell below 150%, this would get liquidated, the ETH would be in there, the, the vault could then sell the ETH the, uh, um, to, to produce the more die. So we always had the collateral. So the incentive structure is there to make people uh, drop ETH in the vaults, lock it up, pull die out, and they would pay some level of interest, right? I'm, I'm providing ETH into these vaults, I get die back, I can go transact in die. And now we have die, you know, out there in the world on the blockchain that, that, that can actually be transacted against. Um, the maker token, of course, trades uh, kind of irrespective of this because the, you, you have to have the, the maker token in order to pay the interest. Okay, so there's value in the MKR token to pay the interest. Now, if I get liquidated, there is also a uh, liquidity fee. There's, there's a fee that I pay a transaction because, um, it's, it, because now they have to go liquidate my ETH. It's kind of a pain. It, it's, it's no different than if I get liquidated in, in a traditional finance loan. Okay, it's a, it's a pain to do, and they don't want to have to do this. They don't want to have to liquidate because it actually hurts the ecosystem to do that. Therefore, most people have like a, most people will do like a 200 to 300% collateralization rate because they don't want to get liquidated. Now, not everyone's doing that anymore because we've seen all sorts of apps that will actually help you manage your liquidation rate, help you manage your collateralization rate, give you alerts when it starts to get close. So maybe you can put more ETH in and be able to uh, not get liquidated in your positions. And of course, people have, have um, taken this and, and found ways to actually uh, make money on their, on their debt positions because now you can, you can have a, a position that's actually earning you money by locking uh, up in the vault. Now, the other thing that, uh, may, that DAI has done uh, kind of more recently is they have created, they had single collateral DAI, now they have multi, MCD, multi-collateral DAI. They're enabling, they've enabled other cryptocurrencies to be able to use, be used inside the vaults. Well, this is great because now we're not 100% beholden to the price of ETH. The price of ETH can go up and down, but I can, I can, you know, lock up other uh, tokens in here, other ERC, other Ethereum tokens in here, uh, and produce DAI. And now it's, a, it's you know, partially a matter of, what, of the oracles that are being used to define these prices, of course. But I can lock up other cryptocurrencies now in the vault and produce DAI. And that makes it for a more stable ecosystem, ideally. Because ideally, at some point, all these different cryptocurrencies, whether it's ETH or uh, BAT or 0x or whatever else that I can lock up in here and produce DAI, um, they, they essentially at some point should, don't, will, will not all move in concert together. So sometimes ETH will go up and the others will go down. Sometimes they'll, they'll move in different ways when they all have their own metrics and they're all, they all have their own economics behind them. They can move separately. And that way I might not have to worry as much about my collateralization or my liquidation because, again, if the price of ETH goes down, maybe the price of BAT goes up. Maybe the price of uh, Chainlink, if it's, if it's a... a cryptocurrency that I've used as, as part of my vault, maybe it goes up. So I don't have to worry as much. I can balance that out pretty well and still uh, produce die. So we don't have to worry as much about the liquidation. Now, of course, there were issues, and, and everyone can read about that if they want. When we had Black Thursday, when the entire crypto market fell uh, back in March of, of this year, March of 2020, the entire crypto market fell. All these positions got liquidated. Uh, the value of DAI kind of went crazy for a while. Um, and part of it was because of all these liquidations, and it happened so quickly that the, the price of ETH just fell. The price of Bitcoin fell by like 40 50 percent uh, in a matter of hours and all these positions got liquidated and, and it kind of caused chaos because the system wasn't necessarily built for that. But um, there were some uh, governance changes that were made. The, the folks that owned the maker token, because this is not just a token to provide interest, this is also a governance token. So those that own maker tokens got together, they voted, they, they created some, uh, uh, some new rules, some new regs, 
and got the value of DAI back to around a dollar, okay, with, with some new uh, protocol in there. So, the idea now is DAI is roughly pegged to a dollar, okay, but it's done so algorithmically. It's done so using incentives to drive certain behaviors. Again, maybe not all the, the tech that we talked about here is exactly correct because you want to go look that up and, and look up what is the most up-to-date uh, protocol for uh, MakerDAO, but the idea of it is they created certain incentives to drive the behavior to lock up my cryptocurrency and borrow DAI. It mints DAI as I'm, as I'm borrowing. It creates the DAI out of thin air through this vault and I'm borrowing it and I have to pay it back with interest. This inter interest rate fluctuates all the time to try to give more incentive for people to lock up or less incentive for people to lock up to keep the value, to keep the supply of DAI in line with the demand. Okay, that's the great part is it can always be monitoring the supply and demand. So it's looking at this supply and demand curve and going, where are we on this curve? If, if the demand curve uh, has moved a little bit, we need to move the supply curve. How do we move the supply curve? We change the interest rate and we get more people to actually um, uh, uh, lock up their cryptocurrency and create more DAI or we get people to pay the DAI back and we burn it and take their crypto out because the interest rate is such that they don't they don't want to lock up their cryptocurrency anymore. So that is a little bit of, uh, about DAI. Now DAI because of the fact that it's completely created on chain that means it's it's programmable, right? You can lock it into smart contracts. You can send it back and forth very easily. There's lending that is, there's so much lending that is done on DAI. It was kind of the original one on Compound. You could lend and borrow DAI. Um, you, you, there are all sorts of other transactions utilizing DAI now, and it, it has really um, gone through a lot of these tests. Again, it doesn't, it's, it's not like USDC where we have a dollar an actual US dollar backing everyone, it is done programmatically and algorithmically incentivizing people towards these certain behaviors to lock up their crypto and mint DAI. So that is a bit about DAI, uh, the Maker, Maker DAO, the Maker Foundation, and how that works. We hope you enjoyed this. We hope it makes sense. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. Follow us on Twitter at Interaxis8. Any comments below, let us know. We try to answer all those. If you have any questions, um, and we hope to see you in subsequent videos.